Hey everyone! In this part 7 of our JASP tutorials, we're going to cover independent samples T. And this kind of concludes our three-part T test series where we talked about single sample T, dependent T, or paired samples T, and now independent T. So it does assume a little bit that you've watched the other two, and if not, you can go back and check those two out so that we're not repeating Shapiro Wilkes six times. Um, but we'll still kind of go over everything you need to know for independent T. So first, what is an independent T? Well, well, we'll zoom out, try again. An independent T you, is used often to determine if there are differences between two independent groups. So in the last video, we talked about dependent groups or related groups where one group of participants is tested more than once, usually twice. So an independent T is when you have two completely separate groups of people. And so you can determine if those two groups of people have differences on their dependent variable. It's often known by independent T, uh, between subjects T, unpaired T. Most people call this independent T. So we might be interested if the salaries are different between men and women. That's two independent groups of people where our dependent variable would be salary and the independent variable would be gender. Gender would have two levels or groups, men and women. Okay, we could also use independent T to determine if there are differences in reaction time for people who are under 21 versus people who are 21 and older. Okay. Or we could compare young folks, 21, you know, your college age folks to older folks, 65 and older. So there are lots of potential uses for independent T when the groups of people are different. So we're gonna have two samples instead of one and that's gonna introduce some new complications in our assumptions. Okay. So the assumptions here are gonna change. We're gonna add a lot more of them, you'll notice there are more. So each test that we've done so far, single sample to dependent to independent, we've added more and more assumptions because our tests have gotten more complicated. Okay. So we're going to add at least one more, probably two, I think, from our dependent group. But the first one is still the same, that we have at least one dependent variable that's measured in either ratio or interval scale. So that is always usually the first one because this section is on parametric statistics, which require that kind of dependent variable. The second assumption is a manipulation on the one we used for dependent T, which was that you had two kind of separate measurements of the same people. Now we have two separate groups of people. Okay, so that's the big difference between those two tests. So two separate groups of participants. Okay. Which means we're gonna add this new assumption. So let me leave them all up on the screen here. Uh, the new assumption being that our observations are independent. Each person's score is their own and is not related to anyone else's score. And so you can think of like cheating as an example where scores are related. So if someone cheats off someone in a test, that is no longer their score. Okay. Or if you are in both groups, your scores in group one and group two are not independent. So we just want to make sure each person is their own individual and they their scores are not related to anyone else's scores in the data set. Okay. Um, assumption four should look familiar. There's no outliers in each group individually. So we want to look at our two groups separately um, because now it's the different participants in different conditions. Before we looked at the effect of outliers on that different score. So we had to control for the fact that you were you and you were tested more than once in a dependent test. Now, each group is separate, so we're gonna kind of treat them separately and test the assumptions differently on each group. Now, five should also look familiar. This is our normality assumption, and it's that the uh, sampling distribution for each group should be approximately normal. Again, I really highly recommend the Distribution Bunnies video to help you understand this concept. Um, <clears throat> but, we want to check each group separately since we don't have a good way to really check the sampling distribution other than collect more participants. So what we want to do is just make sure that the groups aren't um, sort of wildly different from normal, right? So 
We also don't want them to be very different distributions from each other. So if we have two kind of negatively skewed groups, right, that's not as bad as if one group is sort of positively skewed and another group is negatively skewed. So they're kind of leaning away from each other, which you might expect if they're very different. So we really want to kind of make sure they kind of look similar-ish and um, we kind of hope that they're normal because that might imply that the sampling distribution is normal. T-tests are very robust to these types of violations. Um, we're going to do Shapiro-Wilk because we've been doing it this whole time, but we could also think about skew and kurtosis. All right, here is a new one, brand new to independent samples T. Okay. And this is homogeneity. So homogeneity implies that there are equal right, variances. So homo, like homo homogeneous, sort of equal, equal. Um, Geneity meaning variance here. And so the variance in each group um, is approximately equal. Okay. And what that implies, and this you can also see on those distribution graphs, right, is that um, our two groups are, uh, are approximately um, equal in their spread in the distribution. Because we don't want to have one group that's like totally flat. Everybody's completely variable. And one group where everybody's exactly the same. Because that implies that the they're, it's difficult to assume that they're coming from the same population. So we'll get to this in just a minute. You can see it kind of coming up here, the uh, hypotheses. But the general idea is that these um, two groups come from the same population. And if they're coming from the same population, they probably should have the same variance for the null to be true. And generally, this is just a big a problem when you try to, to calculate your statistical test if the variances are wildly different. You have to do something to control for it. We'll show you how. So the population variance for each group is approximately the same. Um, if our sample size is kind of equal, the, the equality of variance is one is not such a huge deal. And this is especially true the larger the samples get. Um, so generally we want these to be fairly equal or to do at least some control for it. Okay. And we'll show you the Welch Satterwaith correction, which will help you control for the fact if our groups are wildly different on their variances. Okay. So before we've talked about, well, if you know if something's wrong, you just kind of have to say something's wrong, but we're just and keep that in mind with your test. But now we actually have an option to fix the something wrong. <clears throat> All right, it is not uncommon with smaller samples, especially when you're doing these kind of class examples, to violate or fail one of these tests. Okay. And it's actually not terribly uncommon in real life either <laughs> for real research. So we might correct our data so it doesn't violate the assumption, use an alternative statistical test, or proceed with caution with the analysis and be sure you report so other people can make up their own minds on how they feel about your test, given that it might have violated an assumption. Okay. So we've added even more of them, but most of them are the same. The dependent variable has to be ratio. Our groups have to be separate from each other. The sampling distribution should be normal, which we're going to look at the sample for. Shouldn't be any outliers. Most of those are the same. We've added this new homogeneity one. So let's see how that also changes our null and alternative, right? So we're our little police detective here. And the null hypothesis is that two groups are equal. Nothing happened. There are no differences between groups. They're from the same population. Um, the, everything is the same. Okay. So right now there's a big, like culturally, there's a big conversation going about uh, pay salaries for men and women's soccer. And so the null hypothesis there is that they get paid the same. An alternative hypothesis is that pay is not equal, okay? Or the two groups are from different populations and there's a difference between their dependent variables or their, their population means. So remember here, this is mu, this is the population mean. Okay. And so we'd say, well, maybe women get paid less. Okay. That would be a one-tailed test though. So right now we're not gonna hedge our bets and we're gonna say men and women are paid differently. Okay. So that's an example of a independent t-test. Now the actual example for this particular video is creating a TV advertisement. Okay. So 
what we want to do is make sure this TV advertisement appeals equally to men and women. So we actually want it to not be different, but that's not the way hypothesis testing works. Okay, so we're going to see if there are differences um, and no matter what we actually want. So we're trying to see if we should reject the null to support that there are differences, right? Or um, not reject the null saying there's no evidence that there are differences. So we kind of want to know if, if there are differences between these groups, okay? We can't prove that there's no differences, but maybe we can say, well, there's no evidence of differences. Okay. So we're going to show this to 20 men and 20 women. Wish these sample sizes were a bit larger, but 20 men and 20 women, and they make their engagement scores. Okay. This questionnaire gives us that engagement score. That's the dependent variable. In the data set, what we have is a variable labeled engagement. The independent variable is labeled gender, and it contains two groups, men and women. Okay. Sometimes, though, when people give you data sets, they don't, they don't always use the right labels. So as you can see here in the data, which we'll open in a minute, gender is labeled as one and two, which is really annoying because what is one, right? So we should have labeled it men and women. And if you are having to create data sets of your own from scratch, I really recommend going back and watching uh, maybe the third video, the second or third video about Excel data entry so that you don't make some common mistakes where you enter the data in a way that JAS is not JAS friendly. Um, so what we really want is one column for the IV and one column for the DV. It's very tempting to put men in one column and women in another, but that's not how most statistical programs want you to put the data. So we have a whole video that covers that exact topic. So if you're trying to enter your own data for a final project or something, I'd recommend going back and watching that one. So we want to know if gender has an effect on engagement. So are there differences in engagement between our levels of gender? Um, they hope there's no difference. But when we're statistically testing, that means the null hypothesis still is that there's no difference and that the research hypothesis still is that there is a difference. And we are investigating if there's enough evidence to say there is a difference. Okay. So we can't really support the null. So even though this particular example is written in such a way that they'd like there to be no differences, this is one of those catch 22s. You got to be very careful here. Um, Null hypothesis testing, you can reject the null, okay, or you cannot reject the null. Okay, you can never really accept the null. You have to do other types of testing um, to say we um, support that there's no differences. Okay. All right, it's very tempting to say, well, I didn't reject the null. It wasn't statistically significant. So that means that, um, you know, there's no differences in the groups, right? We've, we've, supported that there's no differences. Well, what we've really said is that there's no evidence for differences. Okay, that's a different, um, a different type of subtle interpretation. Okay. So let's open up this data. Okay, so I'm gonna click on the hamburger icon, open uh, computer, pick the data set, which is independent samples T, our example. All right, first thing we gotta do is deal with this gender column, which is not appropriately labeled. So let's check that out. At the moment it says one and two. We could go into Excel and rename all those to male and female, but really wanna show you how JASP has this cool option to change them directly in JASP. So what we're gonna do is come over here and click hover over the variable name. And it says, it says click here to change labels. Well, you can't like, the, it's very, <laughs> you kind of like want to click on that because it pops up, but you actually just click on the name of the variable. Ta -da. You here, you have value and then you have label, click on the label itself and you change it. And I can't remember which one's which, which is why you shouldn't do this. One is male, two is female. You'll notice how automatically that changed everything in here. Excellent. So once you have these relabeled, hit the little X, 
and you can always go back and change it later. So it does save this for you if you realize you did it the wrong way. You can go back and fix it. All right. Now that we've fixed those, excellent, excellent. We want to hit the X button to go make it go away, and let's get into actually running the test. First assumption, is the data at least interval or ratio? Yes, we're using ratio data. So this engagement score um, is calculated so that uh, it's ratio scale data. Now we want to calculate outliers by groups. So this is a little different. So we're going to click on descriptives and kind of follow the same procedure we've done before. So click descriptives, descriptives. And normally we move over the dependent variable into variables and we look at the scores and we click on plots. But now what we want to do is take gender here, put it into the split option. Okay. Notice here you can only split on categorical variables or ordinal scale variables. Okay. So this here has to have these little three circles to denote that it is categorical, meaning it's groups. Here that split our data, so now we have the scores by gender. We're going to come down here, click plots, and get distribution plots. I can add display density if you really want to see the, the lines. Okay, if that helps you interpret. Um, interpret. Mostly it doesn't look like there are any outliers. Outliers would be dots that are very far away from everybody else and kind of flatten out and then pop up again, and these look pretty pretty tightly clustered if you look at especially at the bottoms here. You can also click on box plots to get the box plots by group. It's really handy. Click on label outliers and jitter element. Okay. And so remember the jitter adds the little circles and puts them you know slightly off sides to each other left and right so the the left and right part doesn't matter so much it just so that they aren't all on top of each other. So let's come back over here. That's everything that I've described. Now let's interpret those. Okay. Do I think there are any outliers in these plots? Nope. Nope. Okay. Um, another thing is I can interpret this graph. Remember this is the median, first quartile, third quartile. So this is the interquartile range. These scores out here are the Intercourt the, the quartile minus 1.5 times the interquartile range, and anything that's an outlier will appear outside of these lines. Okay, you'll get a little circle and it'll have the row number next to it. Okay. So we don't have any outliers. Now we can now kind of nicely see the men and women stacked up next to each other, unlike our uh, histogram plots here where we kind of have to remember to look at the y-axis or I'm sorry the x-axis here they're clearly spread a little differently that's a different assumption right so men's scores seem slightly higher than women's scores and women seem to have a slightly wider range we'll have to decide in a minute if that is bad or not yeah. is the dependent variable normally distributive remember we want the sampling distribution to be normal but we're going to try uh, the Shapiro-Wilk just to look at each one. And do remember, since we made these plots the first time, you can come down here to Statistics, In Descriptives, and click Shapiro-Wilks. And that will actually put it right up here in your Descriptives box. In the guide, it tells you to run the independent t-test. So let's do that. we got to do it anyway. So t-test, independent t-test. So this is a little different than what we've got. So we're going to move engagement over here to variables gender into grouping variable. So that looks a lot like our descriptives box. We want to add these two down here, normality and equality of variances. Homogeneity, equality of variances. So that's everything that's gone on here. So let's look at our assumptions check, which pops up here on Shapiro-Wilk, and then in a second we'll look at this one. So we ran our Shapiro-Wilk for each group. Remember, we don't want this to be significant. Um, so P less than alpha, which we're going to say is 0.05, um, because that would be significantly bad because it's an assumptions check. So you got to keep assumptions checking and statistical testing, right? Null hypothesis testing um, separate. 
Okay, so you don't want your assumptions to fail. <laughs> okay, just like you don't want to fail this class. So uh, the Shapiro-Wilk is run for each group separately, and it looks like both of them are fairly normal. Larger samples, we could uh, assure that our, our um, sampling distribution is normal, but kind of the best way that we have to test this is by looking at the sample itself. All right, now homogeneity of variance is our new one. Okay. We click equality of variances here to get Levine's test. Levine's test is like, at this point, is um, essentially a t-test on the variances. Okay, it's actually an ANOVA, but we haven't quite gotten to that section yet, so you'll learn more about ANOVA soon. But it, it's essentially a measure, instead of using the means, it tests if there are differences in those variances. And so we want our two groups' variances to be equal in the population because it's actually kind of an implicit assumption that these two groups are from the same population. And if they're from the same population, i.e. the null is accurate, the um, variances should be the same. Okay. So if variances are unequal, we can pr we're generally going to get more of a type 1 error. So we're likely to find something that isn't real or isn't uh, doesn't represent the, the true population. Okay. Um, so the same rules for Levine's applies as the Shapiro-Wilk. We do not want it to be significant. That would be significantly bad. Okay. In our case, this is P equals 0.174, which is um, greater than 0.05. So that would indicate that we have met the assumption of homogeneity variances. However, if our test returns a p-value of less than 0.05, that would imply that the variances are unequal and we've violated that assumption. Okay. So we here, we would say that the variances for the groups are fairly equal. They look, they, you know, we've, we don't have any evidence that they're unequal, basically. Okay. So here's the rules. If your test meets the homogeneity variances, okay, you can run a standard independent samples T. Okay, that's the student's T listed here. If your test does not meet the assumption, okay, you have to reject that equal variances, and P is less than 0.05, you could run a Welch's T. Okay, this is the Welch Satterwaith correction. And what that does is it fixes your test for you. Okay, how does it fix it? Well, it's kind of hard to explain until we look at the actual T, but here's um, uh, some output if we were to use that correction, which we're not because we're okay, but here's an example of what you should do if you're not okay. Notice here's the T-test, okay. and then here's the Welch test. T itself does not change. Check out what happens here in the degrees of freedom column. So essentially the, the correction changes your degrees of freedom for the amount of violation you have. So the larger the violation of equality of variances, the more it corrects for you. Okay. When you change the degrees of freedom, that also correspondingly changes your p-value. Because remember the, the distributions of t okay, change based on how many people you have in them, right? That's the, the whole idea of a like central um, the, the, the video, the distribution of bunnies video, central limit theorem, right? Remember, it shows you how it changes based on the number of people that's for the sampling distribution. So kind of that same principle applies where the more people you have um, or the, the change in sample size changes your cutoff score for T, what's considered significant. Okay? And so when it changes what's considered significant, that affects the p-values. So when T is, is, I'm sorry, when there are larger sample sizes, um, the distribution gets more normal and P values, uh, the, the kind of cutoff score gets smaller, right? The distribution shrinks up, it gets skinnier. The less people there are, the less degrees of freedom, it kind of flattens out a little more. Okay? So what you'll generally see here is that the degrees of freedom goes down, P values go up. All right, T and D do not change because we don't change the math there. All right, 
so to finish out our test, this is just an explanation. We're going to um, add effect size here. and actually gives you several options, but I'm going to stick with Cohen's D. So we are looking at the same one each time. And don't forget, you can change your hy hypothesis here if um, necessary. And then you can say who's group one, who's group two. It'll list them for you. So males come at first and then females. We're going to add our descriptives. And we could add a descriptives plot here. Okay. If you want to see the difference between men and women kind of next to each other, because this one, remember here is the median, not the mean, okay, but it gives me a very similar kind of feel. All right. So we added our descriptives by clicking on descriptives. All right. So let's report this stuff. Here's the real test because we didn't need to correct. Okay. Um, oh, I don't know what the battery icon was about. <laughs> because it's plugged in, so we'll just pretend like we didn't see it. Um, so, <clears throat> when the home assumption of homogeneity of variances is met, you can interpret the results from our standard t-test. The standard t-test is calculated by taking mean group one minus mean of group two divided by error. So remember that's for all three t-tests, the difference on the top and the error on the bottom. The error in an independent t-test is based on pooled variances. What the heck does that mean? Pooled variances is this um, idea that we're going to kind of um, average. It's not quite an average. It's a weighted average of the variances between groups. So if you had 20 men and 24 women, you should give a little bit more weight to that larger group because you have more evidence from that group. Okay. So a, the standard error for a t-test is based on weighting the variances from each group to then calculate standard error. And there's a lot of steps if you do this thing by hand. It's so much easier to let the computer do it. Um, but the standard error is no longer, um, you know, standard deviation by, divided by the square root n. It's this like kind of complicated formula that weights each group's um, variance, right? This is why the, vari the equality of variances is so important is because we're weighting them and we're hoping that they're roughly equal because if they're not, that's gonna to kind of throw that off. Okay. All right, so when they're not equal, we use a different test. The next thing we're gonna see here is T. Oopsies. Okay, made that angry. Let's go back down here, T. And we'll just explain kind of what T is. Um, and then we'll go to degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is still N minus one, but it's N minus one plus n minus one. Okay. So it's group one, 19, group two, 19, together that's 38. So in this section of the course, if you can remember that it's n minus one, you'll be pretty good. But for independent t, that's n minus one plus n minus one. Last column we get here is p. Well, okay, second to last column. <laughs> we get is p, remember the rules for statistical significance. Okay. So in our case, P equals 0 0.023, which is less than our alpha, 0 0.05. And so we would conclude that there is evidence that there's differences between these two groups on those engagement scores, okay? Because the null hypothesis is that there's no difference. So maybe the advertising company should be concerned. All right, last thing we've added here is our effect size. Remember the rules for effect sizes we looked at in our single sample t-test video, which were 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0.8. And uh, those are just general guidelines as you start to learn these sorts of statistics. So this is close to large. Okay. So I could say somewhere between medium and large. Okay. Here's how I might throw that all together in a sentence. So there's a statistically significant difference in engagement scores between men and women where males are scoring higher than females because I've seen the descriptives, which we'll get back to in a minute. So we report our T, our P, and our D. We should think about our assumption checks, and then here's just an example of how I might report those. Engagement scores for each level of gender were normally distributed, as assessed by Shapiro-Wilkes. Then I'd have to talk about Levine's test, which we haven't seen how to report, but here we're just going to suggest reporting uh, just the p-value. In some of the other videos, we'll talk a little bit more about how Levine's is different for ANOVA's test. Okay. So the homogeneity variances for engagement scores for men and women, was, there was homogeneity, 
Okay, this assumption was met as assessed by Levine's test. Right. Now we've got our sample sizes, our means, our standard deviations for men and women. And this is how I know I can say that men were more engaged than women. And we'd report, want to report each group's means and at least standard deviations. Again, we're reporting all of these numbers so that people can decide for themselves. They can also determine if your test was computed correctly. So report all that together. There's 20 men and women. An independent t-test was analyzed to determine, this is going to tell you a little bit about the study, if there are differences in engagement to an advertisement between these men and women. Once you tell people a little bit about the study, tell them about the assumptions. There's no outliers, the engagement scores are normally distributed, and there's homogeneity of variances. Okay. Once you tell them about the assumptions, tell them about the test and the descriptives. So the advertisement was more engaging to men participants than women participants. This was indicated by a large effect size, okay, 0.75, and a significant difference between groups. So that's just kind of the general rules for write-ups. We start by telling you a little bit about the study, assumptions, followed by descriptives and the test itself. Okay. So altogether, that completes our t-test section where we've covered single, independent, and dependent t. And then in the next sections, we'll move on to uh, ANOVAs, then followed by regression, and um, in some classes, chi-square.